So many others have tried their hand at putting together a story of the wonderful harvest of scripture and history that took place among us, using reports handed down by the original eyewitnesses who served this word with their very lives. Since I have investigated all the reports in close detail, starting from the story's beginning, I decided to write it all out for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can know beyond the shadow of a doubt the reliability of what you were taught. During the rule of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest assigned service in the regiment of Abijah. His name was Zechariah. His wife was descended from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. Together they lived honorably before God, careful in keeping to the ways of the commandments and enjoying a clear conscience before God. But they were childless because Elizabeth could never conceive, and now they were quite old. It so happened that as Zechariah was carrying out his priestly duties before God, working the shift assigned to his regiment, it came his one turn in life to enter the sanctuary of God and burn incense. The congregation was gathered and praying outside the temple at the hour of the incense offering. Unannounced, an angel of God appeared just to the right of the altar of incense. Zachariah was paralyzed in fear. But the angel reassured him, Don't fear, Zachariah. Your prayer has been heard. Elizabeth, your wife, will bear a son by you. You are to name him John. You're going to leap like a gazelle for joy, and not only you, many will delight in his birth. He'll achieve great stature with God. He'll drink neither wine nor beer. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit from the moment he leaves his mother's womb. He will turn many sons and daughters of Israel back to their God. He will herald God's arrival in the style and strength of Elijah, soften the hearts of parents to children, and kindle devout understanding among hardened skeptics, he'll get the people ready for God. Zechariah said to the angel, Do you expect me to believe this? I'm an old man and my wife is an old woman. But the angel said, I am Gabriel, the sentinel of God, sent especially to bring you this glad news. But because you won't believe me, you'll be unable to say a word until the day of your son's birth. Every word I've spoken to you will come true on time, God's time. Meanwhile, the congregation waiting for Zechariah was getting restless, wondering what was keeping him so long in the sanctuary. When he came out and couldn't speak, they knew he had seen a vision. He continued speechless and had to use sign language with the people. When the course of his priestly assignment was completed, he went back home. It wasn't long before his wife, Elizabeth, conceived. She went off by herself for five months, relishing her pregnancy. So, this is how God acts to remedy my unfortunate condition she said. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to the Galilean village of Nazareth to a virgin engaged to be married to a man descended from David. His name was Joseph, and the virgin's name, Mary. Upon entering, Gabriel greeted her. Good morning. You're beautiful with God's beauty. Beautiful inside and out. God be with you. She was thoroughly shaken, wondering what was behind a greeting like that. But the angel assured her, Mary, you have nothing to fear. God has a surprise for you, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son and call his name Jesus. He will be great. Be called, Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will rule Jacob's house forever. No end, ever, to his kingdom. Mary said to the angel, But how? I've never slept with a man. The angel answered, 
The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Highest hover over you. Therefore, the child you bring to birth will be called Holy, Son of God. And did you know that your cousin Elizabeth conceived a son, old as she is? Everyone called her barren, and here she is six months pregnant. Nothing, you see, is impossible with God. And Mary said, Yes, I see it all now. I'm the Lord's maid, ready to serve. Let it be with me. Just as you say. Then the angel left her. Mary didn't waste a minute. She got up and traveled to a town in Judah in the hill country, straight to Zachariah's house, and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in her womb leaped. She was filled with the Holy Spirit, and sang out exuberantly, You're so blessed among women. And the babe in your womb, also blessed. And why am I so blessed that? The mother of my Lord visits me. The moment the sound of your greeting entered my ears. The babe in my womb skipped like a lamb for sheer joy. Blessed woman, who believed what God said. Believed every word would come true. And Mary said, I'm bursting with God news. I'm dancing the song of my Savior God. God took one good look at me, and look what happened. I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God whose very name is holy, set apart from all others. His mercy flows in wave after wave. On those who are in awe before him. He bared his arm and showed his strength. Scattered the bluffing braggarts. He knocked tyrants off their high horses. Pulled victims out of the mud. The starving poor sat down to a banquet. The callous rich were left out in the cold. He embraced his chosen child, Israel. He remembered and piled on the mercies, piled them high. It's exactly what he promised. Beginning with Abraham and right up to now. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months and then went back to her own home. When Elizabeth was full term in her pregnancy, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives, seeing that God had overwhelmed her with mercy, celebrated with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and were calling him Zachariah after his father. But his mother intervened, No. He is to be called John. But, they said, No one in your family is named that. They used sign language to ask Zachariah what he wanted him named. Asking for a tablet, Zachariah wrote, His name is to be John. That took everyone by surprise. Surprise followed surprise, Zachariah's mouth was now open, his tongue loose, and he was talking, praising God. A deep, reverential fear settled over the neighborhood, and in all that Judean hill country people talked about nothing else. Everyone who heard about it took it to heart, wondering, what will become of this child? Clearly. God has his hand in this. Then Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He came and set his people free. He set the power of salvation in the center of our lives. And in the very house of David his servant. Just as he promised long ago. Through the preaching of his holy prophets deliverance from our enemies, and every hateful hand, mercy to our fathers, as he remembers to do what he said he'd do, what he swore to our father Abraham, a clean rescue from the enemy camp, 
so we can worship him without a care in the world. Made holy before him as long as we live. And you, my child, prophet of the highest, will go ahead of the master to prepare his ways. Present the offer of salvation to his people. The forgiveness of their sins. Through the heartfelt mercies of our God. God's sunrise will break in upon us. Shining on those in the darkness. Those sitting in the shadow of death. Then showing us the way, one foot at a time. Down the path of peace. The child grew up healthy and spirited. He lived out in the desert until the day he made his prophetic debut in Israel. About that time Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the empire. This was the first census when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone had to travel to his own ancestral hometown to be accounted for. So Joseph went from the Galilean town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem in Judah, David's town, for the census. As a descendant of David, he had to go there. He went with Mary, his fiancée, who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the hostel. There were shepherds camping in the neighborhood. They had set night watches over their sheep. Suddenly, God's angel stood among them and God's glory blazed around them. They were terrified. The angel said, Don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody, worldwide, a Savior has just been born in David's town, a Savior who is Messiah and Master. This is what you're to look for, a baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. At once the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the heavenly heights. Peace to all men and women on earth who please Him. As the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the shepherds talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. They left, running, and found Mary and Joseph, and the baby lying in the manger. Seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child. All who heard the shepherds were impressed. Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear, deep within herself. The shepherds returned and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly the way they'd been told. When the eighth day arrived, the day of circumcision, the child was named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived. Then when the days stipulated by Moses for purification were complete, they took him up to Jerusalem to offer him to God as commanded in God's law, every male who opens the womb shall be a holy offering to God, and also to sacrifice the pair of doves or two young pigeons, prescribed in God's law. In Jerusalem at the time, there was a man, Simeon by name, a good man, a man who lived in the prayerful expectancy of help for Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. The Holy Spirit had shown him that he would see the Messiah of God before he died. Led by the Spirit, he entered the temple. As the parents of the child Jesus brought him in to carry out the rituals of the law, Simeon took him into his arms and blessed God. God, you can now release your servant. Release me in peace as you promised. With my own eyes I've seen your salvation. It's now out in the open for everyone to see. A God-revealing light to the non-Jewish nations. And of glory for your people Israel. Jesus' father and mother were speechless with surprise at these words. 
Simeon went on to bless them, and said to Mary his mother. This child marks both the failure and the recovery of many in Israel. A figure misunderstood and contradicted. The pain of a sword thrust through you. But the rejection will force honesty. As God reveals who they really are. Anna the prophetess was also there, a daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher. She was by now a very old woman. She had been married seven years and a widow for eighty-four. She never left the temple area, worshipping night and day with her fastings and prayers. At the very time Simeon was praying, she showed up, broke into an anthem of praise to God, and talked about the child to all who were waiting expectantly for the freeing of Jerusalem. When they finished everything required by God in the law, they returned to Galilee in their own town, Nazareth. There the child grew strong in body and wise in spirit. And the grace of God was on him. Every year Jesus' parents traveled to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. When he was twelve years old, they went up as they always did for the feast. When it was over and they left for home, the child Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know it. Thinking he was somewhere in the company of pilgrims, they journeyed for a whole day and then began looking for him among relatives and neighbors. When they didn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem looking for him. The next day they found him in the temple seated among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. The teachers were all quite taken with him, impressed with the sharpness of his answers. But his parents were not impressed, they were upset and hurt. His mother said, Young man, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been half out of our minds looking for you. He said, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I had to be here, dealing with the things of my father? But they had no idea what he was talking about. So he went back to Nazareth with them, and lived obediently with them. His mother held these things dearly, deep within herself. And Jesus matured, growing up in both body and spirit, blessed by both God and people. In the fifteenth year of the rule of Caesar Tiberius, it was while Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, ruler of Galilee, his brother Philip, ruler of Ituria and Trachonitis, Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the chief priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, John, Zachariah's son, out in the desert at the time, received a message from God. He went all through the country around the Jordan River preaching a baptism of life change leading to forgiveness of sins, as described in the words of Isaiah the prophet. Thunder in the desert. Prepare God's arrival. Make the road smooth and straight. Every ditch will be filled in. Every bump smoothed out. The detours straightened out. All the ruts paved over. Everyone will be there to see. The Parade of God's Salvation When crowds of people came out for baptism because it was the popular thing to do, John exploded, brood of snakes. What do you think you're doing slithering down here to the river? Do you think a little water on your snakeskins is going to deflect God's judgment? It's your life that must change, not your skin. And don't think you can pull rank by claiming Abraham as father. Being a child of Abraham is neither here nor there, children of Abraham are a dime a dozen. God can make children from stones if he wants. What counts is your life. Is it green and flourishing? Because if it's dead wood, it goes on the fire. The crowd asked him, then what are we supposed to do? If you have two coats, give one away, he said. Do the same with your food. Taxmen also came to be baptized and said, Teacher, 
what should we do? He told them, no more extortion, collect only what is required by law. Soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He told them, no harassment, no blackmail, and be content with your rations. The interest of the people by now was building. They were all beginning to wonder, could this John be the Messiah? But John intervened, I'm baptizing you here in the river. The main character in this drama, to whom I'm a mere stagehand, will ignite the kingdom life, a fire, the Holy Spirit within you, changing you from the inside out. He's going to clean house, make a clean sweep of your lives. He'll place everything true in its proper place before God, everything false he'll put out with the trash to be burned. There was a lot more of this, words that gave strength to the people, words that put heart in them. The Message But Herod, the ruler, stung by John's rebuke in the matter of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, capped his long string of evil deeds with this outrage he put John in jail. After all the people were baptized, Jesus was baptized. As he was praying, the sky opened up and the Holy Spirit, like a dove descending, came down on him. And along with the Spirit, a voice, You are my Son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. When Jesus entered public life he was about thirty years old, the Son, in public perception, of Joseph, who was son of Heli, son of Matthat, son of Levi, son of Melchi, son of Janai, son of Joseph, son of Metathias, son of Amos, son of Nahum, son of Esli, son of Nagai, Son of Math, Son of Metathias, Son of Semain, Son of Josek, Son of Joda, Son of Jonan, Son of Risa, Son of Zerubbabel, Son of Shealtiel, Son of Neri, Son of Melchi, Son of Adi, Son of Kosam, Son of El Madam, Son of Er, Son of Joshua, Son of Eliezer, Son of Joram, Son of Matthat, Son of Levi, Son of Simeon, Son of Judah, Son of Joseph, Son of Jonam, Son of Eliakim, Son of Malia, Son of Mena, Son of Metatha, Son of Nathan, Son of David, Son of Jesse, Son of Obed, Son of Boaz, Son of Salmon, Son of Nashon, Son of Ammonadab, Son of Admin, Son of Arni, Son of Hezron, Son of Perez, Son of Judah, Son of Jacob, Son of Isaac, Son of Abraham, Son of Terah, Son of Nahar, Son of Serek, Son of Ru, Son of Pelek, Son of Eber, Son of Shelah, Son of Kenan, Son of Arphaxad, Son of Shem, Son of Noah, Son of Lamech, Son of Methuselah, Son of Enoch, Son of Jared, Son of Mahalalel, Son of Kenan, Son of Enos, Son of Seth, Son of Adam, Son of God, now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wild. For forty wilderness days and nights he was tested by the devil. 
He ate nothing during those days, and when the time was up he was hungry. The devil, playing on his hunger, gave the first test, since you're God's son, command this stone to turn into a loaf of bread. Jesus answered by quoting Deuteronomy, it takes more than bread to really live. For the second test he led him up and spread out all the kingdoms of the earth on display at once. Then the devil said, they're yours in all their splendor to serve your pleasure. I'm in charge of them all and can turn them over to whomever I wish. Worship me and they're yours, the whole works. Jesus refused, again backing his refusal with Deuteronomy, Worship the Lord your God and only the Lord your God. Serve him with absolute single-heartedness. For the third test the devil took him to Jerusalem and put him on top of the temple. He said, If you are God's son, jump. It's written, isn't it, that, he has placed you in the care of angels to protect you, they will catch you, you won't so much as stub your toe on a stone. Yes, said Jesus, and it's also written, don't you dare tempt the Lord your God. That completed the testing. The devil retreated temporarily, lying in wait for another opportunity. Jesus returned to Galilee powerful in the spirit. News that he was back spread through the countryside. He taught in their meeting places to everyone's acclaim and pleasure. He came to Nazareth where he had been raised. As he always did on the Sabbath, he went to the meeting place. When he stood up to read, he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. God's Spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor. Sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. To set the burdened and battered free. To announce, this is God's time to shine. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the place was on him, intent. Then he started in, you've just heard scripture make history. It came true just now in this place. All who were there, watching and listening, were surprised at how well he spoke. But they also said, isn't this Joseph's son, the one we've known since he was just a kid? He answered, I suppose you're going to quote the proverb, Doctor, go heal yourself. Do hear in your hometown what we heard you did in Capernaum. Well, let me tell you something, no prophet is ever welcomed in his hometown. Isn't it a fact that there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah during that three and a half years of drought when famine devastated the land, but the only widow to whom Elijah was sent was in Sarepta in Sidon? And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha but the only one cleansed was Naaman the Syrian. That set everyone in the meeting place seething with anger. They threw him out banishing him from the village, then took him to a mountain cliff at the edge of the village to throw him to his doom, but he gave them the slip and was on his way. He went down to Capernaum, a village in Galilee. He was teaching the people on the Sabbath. They were surprised and impressed, his teaching was so forthright, so confident, so authoritative, not the quibbling and quoting they were used to. In the meeting place that day there was a man demonically disturbed. He screamed, Stop! What business do you have here with us, Jesus? Nazarene! I know what you're up to. You're the Holy One of God and you've come to destroy us. Jesus shut him up, quiet. Get out of him. The demonic spirit threw the man down in front of them all and left. The demon didn't hurt him. That knocked the wind out of everyone and got them whispering and wondering, what's going on here? Someone whose words make things happen. 
someone who orders demonic spirits to get out and they go. Jesus was the talk of the town. He left the meeting place and went to Simon's house. Simon's mother-in-law was running a high fever and they asked him to do something for her. He stood over her, told the fever to leave, and it left. Before they knew it, she was up getting dinner for them. When the sun went down, everyone who had anyone sick with some ailment or other brought them to him. One by one he placed his hands on them and healed them. Demons left in droves, screaming, Son of God! You're the Son of God! But he shut them up, refusing to let them speak because they knew too much, knew him to be the Messiah. He left the next day for open country. But the crowds went looking and, when they found him, clung to him so he couldn't go on. He told them, Don't you realize that there are yet other villages where I have to tell the message of God's kingdom, that this is the work God sent me to do? Meanwhile he continued preaching in the meeting places of Galilee. Once when he was standing on the shore of Lake Genesaret, the crowd was pushing in on him to better hear the word of God. He noticed two boats tied up. The fishermen had just left them and were out scrubbing their nets. He climbed into the boat that was Simon's and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Sitting there, using the boat for a pulpit, he taught the crowd. When he finished teaching, he said to Simon, push out into deep water and let your nets out for a catch. Simon said, Master, we've been fishing hard all night and haven't caught even a minnow. But if you say so, I'll let out the nets. It was no sooner said than done, a huge haul of fish, straining the nets past capacity. They waved to their partners in the other boat to come help them. They filled both boats, nearly swamping them with the catch. Simon Peter, when he saw it, fell to his knees before Jesus. Master, leave. I'm a sinner and can't handle this holiness. Leave me to myself. When they pulled in that catch of fish, awe overwhelmed Simon and everyone with him. It was the same with James and John, Zebedee's sons, co-workers with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, There is nothing to fear. From now on you'll be fishing for men and women. They pulled their boats up on the beach, left them, nets and all, and followed him. One day in one of the villages there was a man covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus he fell down before him in prayer and said, If you want to, you can cleanse me. Jesus put out his hand, touched him, and said, I want to. Be clean. Then and there his skin was smooth, the leprosy gone. Jesus instructed him, Don't talk about this all over town. Just quietly present your healed self to the priest, along with the offering ordered by Moses. Your cleansed and obedient life, not your words, will bear witness to what I have done. But the man couldn't keep it to himself, and the word got out. Soon a large crowd of people had gathered to listen and be healed of their sicknesses. As often as possible Jesus withdrew to out-of-the-way places for prayer. One day as he was teaching, Pharisees and religion teachers were sitting around. They had come from nearly every village in Galilee and Judea, even as far away as Jerusalem, to be there. The healing power of God was on him. Some men arrived carrying a paraplegic on a stretcher. They were looking for a way to get into the house and set him before Jesus. When they couldn't find a way in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, removed some tiles, and let him down in the middle of everyone, right in front of Jesus. Impressed by their bold belief, he said, Friend, I forgive your sins. That set the religion scholars and Pharisees buzzing. Who does he think he is? 
That's blasphemous talk. God and only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking and said, Why all this gossipy whispering? Which is simpler, to say, I forgive your sins, or to say, get up and start walking? Well, just so it's clear that I'm the Son of Man and authorized to do either, or both. He now spoke directly to the paraplegic, get up. Take your bedroll and go home. Without a moment's hesitation, he did it, got up, took his blanket, and left for home, giving glory to God all the way. The people rubbed their eyes, stunned, and then also gave glory to God. Awestruck, they said, we've never seen anything like that. After this he went out and saw a man named Levi at his work collecting taxes. Jesus said, come along with me. And he did, walked away from everything and went with him. Levi gave a large dinner at his home for Jesus. Everybody was there, tax men and other disreputable characters as guests at the dinner. The Pharisees and their religion scholars came to his disciples greatly offended. What is he doing eating and drinking with misfits and sinners? Jesus heard about it and spoke up, who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders, an invitation to a changed life, changed inside and out. They asked him, John's disciples are well known for keeping fasts and saying prayers. Also the Pharisees. But you seem to spend most of your time at parties. Why? Jesus said, when you're celebrating a wedding, you don't skimp on the cake and wine. You feast. Later you may need to exercise moderation, but this isn't the time. As long as the bride and groom are with you, you have a good time. When the groom is gone, the fasting can begin. No one throws cold water on a friendly bonfire. This is kingdom come. No one cuts up a fine silk scarf to patch old work clothes, you want fabrics that match. And you don't put wine in old, cracked bottles, you get strong, clean bottles for your fresh vintage wine. And no one who has ever tasted fine aged wine prefers Uniged wine. On a certain Sabbath Jesus was walking through a field of ripe grain. His disciples were pulling off heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands to get rid of the chaff, and eating them. Some Pharisees said, Why are you doing that, breaking a Sabbath rule? But Jesus stood up for them. Have you never read what David and those with him did when they were hungry? How he entered the sanctuary and ate fresh bread off the altar, bread that no one but priests were allowed to eat. He also handed it out to his companions. Then he said, The Son of Man is no slave to the Sabbath, he's in charge. On another Sabbath he went to the meeting place and taught. There was a man there with a crippled right hand. The religion scholars and Pharisees had their eyes on Jesus to see if he would heal the man, hoping to catch him in a Sabbath violation. He knew what they were up to and spoke to the man with the crippled hand, Get up and stand here before us. He did. Then Jesus addressed them, Let me ask you something, what kind of action suits the Sabbath best? Doing good or doing evil? Helping people or leaving them helpless? He looked around, looked each one in the eye. He said to the man, Hold out your hand. He held it out, it was as good as new. They were beside themselves with anger, and started plotting how they might get even with him. At about that same time he climbed a mountain to pray. He was there all night in prayer before God. The next day he summoned his disciples, from them he selected twelve he designated as apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter. 
Andrew, his brother. James. John. Philip. Bartholomew. Matthew. Thomas. James, son of Alphaeus. Simon, called the Zealot. Judas, son of James. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Coming down off the mountain with them, he stood on a plain surrounded by disciples, and was soon joined by a huge congregation from all over Judea and Jerusalem, even from the seaside towns of Tyre and Sidon. They had come both to hear him and to be cured of their diseases. Those disturbed by evil spirits were healed. Everyone was trying to touch him, so much energy surging from him, so many people healed. Then he spoke. You're blessed when you've lost it all. God's kingdom is there for the finding. You're blessed when you're ravenously hungry. Then you're ready for the messianic meal. You're blessed when the tears flow freely. Joy comes with the morning. Count yourself blessed every time someone cuts you down or throws you out, every time someone smears or blackens your name to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and that that person is uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens, skip like a lamb, if you like, for even though they don't like it, I do, and all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company, my preachers and witnesses have always been treated like this. But it's trouble ahead if you think you have it made. What you have is all you'll ever get. And it's trouble ahead if you're satisfied with yourself. Yourself will not satisfy you for long. And it's trouble ahead if you think life's all fun and games. There's suffering to be met, and you're going to meet it. There's trouble ahead when you live only for the approval of others, saying what flatters them, doing what indulges them. Popularity contests are not truth contests, look how many scoundrel preachers were approved by your ancestors. Your task is to be true, not popular. To you who are ready for the truth, I say this, love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the supple moves of prayer for that person. If someone slaps you in the face, stand there and take it. If someone grabs your shirt, gift trap your best coat and make a present of it. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more payback. Live generously. Here is a simple rule of thumb for behavior, ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. If you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run-of-the-mill sinners do that. If you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? Garden variety sinners do that. If you only give for what you hope to get out of it, do you think that's charity? The stingiest of pawnbrokers does that. I tell you, love your enemies. Help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives toward us, generously and graciously, even when we're at our worst. Our Father is kind, you be kind. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. Don't condemn those who are down, that hardness can boomerang. Be easy on people, you'll find life a lot easier. Give away your life, you'll find life given back, but not merely given back, given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. He quoted a proverb, Can a blind man guide a blind man? 
wouldn't they both end up in the ditch? An apprentice doesn't lecture the master. The point is to be careful who you follow as your teacher. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you, when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this I know better than you mentality again, playing a holier than thou part instead of just living your own part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your own face and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. You don't get wormy apples off a healthy tree, nor good apples off a diseased tree. The health of the apple tells the health of the tree. You must begin with your own life-giving lives. It's who you are, not what you say and do, that counts. Your true being brims over into true words and deeds. Why are you so polite with me, always saying, yes, sir, and that's right, sir, but never doing a thing I tell you. These words I speak to you are not mere additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundation words, words to build a life on. If you work the words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who dug deep and laid the foundation of his house on bedrock. When the river burst its banks and crashed against the house, nothing could shake it, it was built to last. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you are like a dumb carpenter who built a house but skipped the foundation. When the swollen river came crashing in, it collapsed like a house of cards. It was a total loss. When he finished speaking to the people, he entered Capernaum. A Roman captain there had a servant who was on his deathbed. He prized him highly and didn't want to lose him. When he heard Jesus was back, he sent leaders from the Jewish community asking him to come and heal his servant. They came to Jesus and urged him to do it, saying, He deserves this. He loves our people. He even built our meeting place. Jesus went with them. When he was still quite far from the house, the captain sent friends to tell him, Master, you don't have to go to all this trouble. I'm not that good a person, you know. I'd be embarrassed for you to come to my house, even embarrassed to come to you in person. Just give the order and my servant will get well. I'm a man under orders, I also give orders. I tell one soldier, go, and he goes, another, come, and he comes, my slave, do this, and he does it. Taken aback, Jesus addressed the accompanying crowd, I've yet to come across this kind of simple trust anywhere in Israel, the very people who are supposed to know about God and how he works. When the messengers got back home, they found the servant up and well. Not long after that, Jesus went to the village name. His disciples were with him, along with quite a large crowd. As they approached the village gate, they met a funeral procession, a woman's only son was being carried out for burial. And the mother was a widow. When Jesus saw her, his heart broke. He said to her, Don't cry. Then he went over and touched the coffin. The pallbearers stopped. He said, Young man, I tell you, get up. The dead son sat up and began talking. Jesus presented him to his mother. They all realized they were in a place of holy mystery, that God was at work among them. They were quietly worshipful, and then noisily grateful, calling out among themselves, God is back, looking to the needs of his people. The news of Jesus spread all through the country. John's disciples reported back to him the news of all these events taking place. He sent two of them to the master to ask the question, Are you the one we've been expecting, or are we still waiting? The men showed up before Jesus and said, 
John the Baptizer sent us to ask you, are you the one we've been expecting, or are we still waiting? In the next two or three hours Jesus healed many from diseases, distress, and evil spirits. To many of the blind he gave the gift of sight. Then he gave his answer, Go back and tell John what you have just seen and heard. The blind see. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The wretched of the earth. Have God's salvation hospitality extended to them. Is this what you were expecting? Then count yourselves fortunate. After John's messengers left to make their report, Jesus said more about John to the crowd of people. What did you expect when you went out to see him in the wild? A weekend camper? Hardly. What then? A chic in silk pajamas? Not in the wilderness, not by a long shot. What then? A messenger from God? That's right, a messenger. Probably the greatest messenger you'll ever hear. He is the messenger Malachi announced when he wrote. I'm sending my messenger on ahead. To make the road smooth for you. Let me lay it out for you as plainly as I can, no one in history surpasses John the Baptizer, but in the kingdom he prepared you for, the lowliest person is ahead of him. The ordinary and disreputable people who heard John, by being baptized by him into the kingdom, are the clearest evidence, the Pharisees and religious officials would have nothing to do with such a baptism, wouldn't think of giving up their place in line to their inferiors. How can I account for the people of this generation? They're like spoiled children complaining to their parents, we wanted to skip rope and you were always too tired, we wanted to talk but you were always too busy. John the baptizer came fasting and you called him crazy. The son of man came feasting and you called him a boozer. Opinion polls don't count for much, do they? The proof of the pudding is in the eating. One of the Pharisees asked him over for a meal. He went to the Pharisee's house and sat down at the dinner table. Just then a woman of the village, the town harlot, having learned that Jesus was a guest in the home of the Pharisee, came with a bottle of very expensive perfume and stood at his feet, weeping, raining tears on his feet. Letting down her hair, she dried his feet, kissed them, and anointed them with the perfume. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man was the prophet I thought he was, he would have known what kind of woman this is who is falling all over him. Jesus said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Oh! Tell me! Two men were in debt to a banker. One owed five hundred silver pieces, the other fifty. Neither of them could pay up, and so the banker cancelled both debts. Which of the two would be more grateful? Simon answered, I suppose the one who was forgiven the most. That's right, said Jesus. Then turning to the woman, but speaking to Simon, he said, Do you see this woman? I came to your home, you provided no water for my feet, but she rained tears on my feet and dried them with her hair. You gave me no greeting, but from the time I arrived she hasn't quit kissing my feet. You provided nothing for freshening up, but she has soothed my feet with perfume. Impressive, isn't it? She was forgiven many, many sins, and so she is very, very grateful. If the forgiveness is minimal, the gratitude is minimal. Then he spoke to her, I forgive your sins. That set the dinner guests talking behind his back, who does he think he is, forgiving sins. He ignored them and said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He continued according to plan, 
traveled to town after town, village after village, preaching God's kingdom, spreading the message. The twelve were with him. There were also some women in their company who had been healed of various evil afflictions and illnesses, Mary, the one called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, Joanna, wife of Chusa, Herod's manager, and Susanna, along with many others who used their considerable means to provide for the company. As they went from town to town, a lot of people joined in and traveled along. He addressed them, using this story, a farmer went out to sow his seed. Some of it fell on the road, it was tramped down and the birds ate it. Other seed fell in the gravel, it sprouted, but withered because it didn't have good roots. Other seed fell in the weeds, the weeds grew with it and strangled it. Other seed fell in rich earth and produced a bumper crop. Are you listening to this? Really listening? His disciples asked, Why did you tell this story? He said, You've been given insight into God's kingdom, you know how it works. There are others who need stories. But even with stories some of them aren't going to get it. Their eyes are open but don't see a thing. Their ears are open but don't hear a thing. This story is about some of those people. The seed is the word of God. The seeds on the road are those who hear the word, but no sooner do they hear it than the devil snatches it from them so they won't believe and be saved. The seeds in the gravel are those who hear with enthusiasm, but the enthusiasm doesn't go very deep. It's only another fad, and the moment there's trouble it's gone. And the seed that fell in the weeds, well, these are the ones who hear, but then the seed is crowded out and nothing comes of it as they go about their lives worrying about tomorrow, making money, and having fun. But the seed in the good earth, these are the good hearts who seize the word and hold on no matter what, sticking with it until there's a harvest. No one lights a lamp and then covers it with a washtub or shoves it under the bed. No, you set it up on a lamp stand so those who enter the room can see their way. We're not keeping secrets, we're telling them. We're not hiding things, we're bringing everything out into the open. So be careful that you don't become misers of what you hear. Generosity begets generosity. Stinginess impoverishes. His mother and brothers showed up but couldn't get through to him because of the crowd. He was given the message, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, my mother and brothers are the ones who hear and do God's word. Obedience is thicker than blood. One day he and his disciples got in a boat. Let's cross the lake, he said. And off they went. It was smooth sailing, and he fell asleep. A terrific storm came up suddenly on the lake. Water poured in, and they were about to capsize. They woke Jesus, Master, Master, we're going to drown. Getting to his feet, he told the wind, silence, and the waves, quiet down. They did it. The lake became smooth as glass. Then he said to his disciples, Why can't you trust me? They were in absolute awe, staggered and stammering, Who is this, anyway? He calls out to the winds and sea, and they do what he tells them. They sailed on to the country of the Gerasenes, directly opposite Galilee. As he stepped out onto land, a madman from town met him, he was a victim of demons. He hadn't worn clothes for a long time, nor lived at home, he lived in the cemetery. When he saw Jesus he screamed, fell before him, and howled, What business do you have messing with me? You're Jesus, son of the high God, but don't give me a hard time. The man said this because Jesus had started to order the unclean spirit out of him. 
Time after time the demon threw the man into convulsions. He had been placed under constant guard and tied with chains and shackles, but crazed and driven wild by the demon, he would shatter the bonds. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Mob. My name is Mob, he said, because many demons afflicted him. And they begged Jesus desperately not to order them to the bottomless pit. A large herd of pigs was grazing and rooting on a nearby hill. The demons begged Jesus to order them into the pigs. He gave the order. It was even worse for the pigs than for the man. Crazed, they stampeded over a cliff into the lake and drowned. Those tending the pigs, scared to death, bolted and told their story in town and country. People went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had been sent, sitting there at Jesus' feet, wearing decent clothes and making sense. It was a holy moment, and for a short time they were more reverent than curious. Then those who had seen it happen told how the demoniac had been saved. Later, a great many people from the Gerasene countryside got together and asked Jesus to leave, too much change, too fast, and they were scared. So Jesus got back in the boat and set off. The man whom he had delivered from the demons asked to go with him, but he sent him back, saying, Go home and tell everything God did in you. So he went back and preached all over town everything Jesus had done in him. On his return, Jesus was welcomed by a crowd. They were all there expecting him. A man came up, Jairus by name. He was president of the meeting place. He fell at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his home because his twelve-year-old daughter, his only child, was dying. Jesus went with him, making his way through the pushing, jostling crowd. In the crowd that day there was a woman who for twelve years had been afflicted with hemorrhages. She had spent every penny she had on doctors but not one had been able to help her. She slipped in from behind and touched the edge of Jesus' robe. At that very moment her hemorrhaging stopped. Jesus said, Who touched me? When no one stepped forward, Peter said, But Master, we've got crowds of people on our hands. Dozens have touched you. Jesus insisted, Someone touched me. I felt power discharging from me. When the woman realized that she couldn't remain hidden, she knelt trembling before him. In front of all the people, she blurted out her story, why she touched him and how at that same moment she was healed. Jesus said, Daughter, you took a risk trusting me, and now you're healed and whole. Live well, live blessed. While he was still talking, someone from the leader's house came up and told him, your daughter died. No need now to bother the teacher. Jesus overheard and said, Don't be upset. Just trust me and everything will be all right. Going into the house, he wouldn't let anyone enter with him except Peter, John, James, and the child's parents. Everyone was crying and carrying on over her. Jesus said, Don't cry. She didn't die, she's sleeping. They laughed at him. They knew she was dead. Then Jesus, gripping her hand, called, My dear child, get up. She was up in an instant, up and breathing again. He told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were ecstatic, but Jesus warned them to keep quiet. Don't tell a soul what happened in this room. Jesus now called the twelve and gave them authority and power to deal with all the demons and cure diseases. He commissioned them to preach the news of God's kingdom and heal the sick. He said, Don't load yourselves up with equipment. Keep it simple, you are the equipment. 
and no luxury inns, get a modest place and be content there until you leave. If you're not welcomed, leave town. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and move on. Commissioned, they left. They traveled from town to town telling the latest news of God, the message, and curing people everywhere they went. Herod, the ruler, heard of these goings on and didn't know what to think. There were people saying John had come back from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, still others that some prophet of long ago had shown up. Herod said, But I killed John, took off his head. So who is this that I keep hearing about? Curious, he looked for a chance to see him in action. The apostles returned and reported on what they had done. Jesus took them away, off by themselves, near the town called Bethsaida. But the crowds got wind of it and followed. Jesus graciously welcomed them and talked to them about the kingdom of God. Those who needed healing, he healed. As the sun set, the twelve said, Dismiss the crowd so they can go to the farms or villages around here and get a room for the night and a bite to eat. We're out in the middle of nowhere. You feed them, Jesus said. They said, We couldn't scrape up more than five loaves of bread and a couple of fish, unless, of course, you want us to go to town ourselves and buy food for everybody. There were more than five thousand people in the crowd. But he went ahead and directed his disciples, sit them down in groups of about fifty. They did what he said, and soon had everyone seated. He took the five loaves and two fish, lifted his face to heaven in prayer, blessed, broke, and gave the bread and fish to the disciples to hand out to the crowd. After the people had all eaten their fill, twelve baskets of leftovers were gathered up. One time when Jesus was off praying by himself, his disciples nearby, he asked them, What are the crowd saying about me, about who I am? They said, John the Baptizer. Others say Elijah. Still others say that one of the prophets from long ago has come back. He then asked, And you, what are you saying about me? Who am I? Peter answered, the Messiah of God. Jesus then warned them to keep it quiet. They were to tell no one what Peter had said. He went on, It is necessary that the Son of Man proceed to an ordeal of suffering, be tried and found guilty by the religious leaders, high priests, and religion scholars, be killed, and on the third day be raised up alive. Then he told them what they could expect for themselves, Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat, I am. Don't run from suffering, embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? If any of you is embarrassed with me and the way I'm leading you, know that the Son of Man will be far more embarrassed with you when he arrives in all his splendor in company with the Father and the holy angels. This isn't, you realize, pie in the sky by and by. Some who have taken their stand right here are going to see it happen, see with their own eyes the kingdom of God. About eight days after saying this, he climbed the mountain to pray, taking Peter, John, and James along. While he was in prayer, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became blinding white. At once two men were there talking with him. They turned out to be Moses and Elijah, and what a glorious appearance they made. They talked over his exodus, the one Jesus was about to complete in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, Peter and those with him were slumped over in sleep. When they came to, rubbing their eyes,
they saw Jesus in his glory and the two men standing with him. When Moses and Elijah had left, Peter said to Jesus, Master, this is a great moment. Let's build three memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He blurted this out without thinking. While he was babbling on like this, a light radiant cloud enveloped them. As they found themselves buried in the cloud, they became deeply aware of God. Then there was a voice out of the cloud, This is my Son, the Chosen. Listen to him. When the sound of the voice died away, they saw Jesus there alone. They were speechless. And they continued speechless, said not one thing to anyone during those days of what they had seen. When they came down off the mountain the next day, a big crowd was there to meet them. A man called from out of the crowd, Please, please, teacher, take a look at my son. He's my only child. Often a spirit seizes him. Suddenly he's screaming, thrown into convulsions, his mouth foaming. And then it beats him black and blue before it leaves. I asked your disciples to deliver him but they couldn't. Jesus said, what a generation. No sense of God. No focus to your lives. How many times do I have to go over these things? How much longer do I have to put up with this? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into convulsions. Jesus stepped in, ordered the foul spirit gone, healed the boy, and handed him back to his father. They all shook their heads in wonder, astonished at God's greatness, God's majestic greatness. While they continued to stand around exclaiming over all the things he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, treasure and ponder each of these next words, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into human hands. They didn't get what he was saying. It was like he was speaking a foreign language and they couldn't make heads or tails of it. But they were embarrassed to ask him what he meant. They started arguing over which of them would be most famous. When Jesus realized how much this mattered to them, he brought a child to his side. Whoever accepts this child as if the child were me, accepts me, he said. And whoever accepts me, accepts the one who sent me. You become great by accepting, not asserting. Your spirit, not your size, makes the difference. John spoke up, Master, we saw a man using your name to expel demons and we stopped him because he wasn't of our group. Jesus said, Don't stop him. If he's not an enemy, he's an ally. When it came close to the time for his ascension, he gathered up his courage and steeled himself for the journey to Jerusalem. He sent messengers on ahead. They came to a Samaritan village to make arrangements for his hospitality. But when the Samaritans learned that his destination was Jerusalem, they refused hospitality. When the disciples James and John learned of it, they said, Master, do you want us to call a bolt of lightning down out of the sky and incinerate them? Jesus turned on them, of course not. And they traveled on to another village. On the road someone asked if he could go along. I'll go with you, wherever, he said. Jesus was curt, are you ready to rough it? We're not staying in the best inns, you know. Jesus said to another, follow me. He said, certainly, but first excuse me for a couple of days, please. I have to make arrangements for my father's funeral. Jesus refused. First things first. Your business is life, not death. And life is urgent, announce God's kingdom. Then another said, I'm ready to follow you, master, but first excuse me while I get things straightened out at home. 
Jesus said, no procrastination. No backward looks. You can't put God's kingdom off till tomorrow. Seize the day. Later the master selected seventy and sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he intended to go. He gave them this charge. What a huge harvest! And how few the harvest hands! So on your knees, ask the God of the harvest to send harvest hands. On your way. But be careful, this is hazardous work. You're like lambs in a wolf pack. Travel light. Comb and toothbrush and no extra luggage. Don't loiter and make small talk with everyone you meet along the way. When you enter a home, greet the family, peace. If your greeting is received, then it's a good place to stay. But if it's not received, take it back and get out. Don't impose yourself. Stay at one home, taking your meals there, for a worker deserves three square meals. Don't move from house to house, looking for the best cook in town. When you enter a town and are received, eat what they set before you, heal anyone who is sick, and tell them, God's kingdom is right on your doorstep. When you enter a town and are not received, go out in the street and say, the only thing we got from you is the dirt on our feet, and we're giving it back. Did you have any idea that God's kingdom was right on your doorstep? Sodom will have it better on Judgment Day than the town that rejects you. Doom, Chorazin. Doom, Bethsaida. If Tyre and Sidon had been given half the chances given you, they'd have been on their knees long ago, repenting and crying for mercy. Tyre and Sidon will have it easy on Judgment Day compared to you. And you, Capernaum. Do you think you're about to be promoted to heaven? Think again. You're on a fast track to hell. The one who listens to you, listens to me. The one who rejects you, rejects me. And rejecting me is the same as rejecting God, who sent me. The seventy came back triumphant. Master, even the demons dance to your tune. Jesus said, I know. I saw Satan fall, a bolt of lightning out of the sky. See what I've given you. Safe passage as you walk on snakes and scorpions, and protection from every assault of the enemy. No one can put a hand on you. All the same, the great triumph is not in your authority over evil, but in God's authority over you and presence with you. Not what you do for God but what God does for you, that's the agenda for rejoicing. At that, Jesus rejoiced, exuberant in the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father, Master of heaven and earth, that you hid these things from the know-it-alls and showed them to these innocent newcomers. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. I've been given it all by my Father. Only the Father knows who the Son is and only the Son knows who the Father is. The Son can introduce the Father to anyone he wants to. He then turned in a private aside to his disciples. Fortunate the eyes that see what you're seeing. There are plenty of prophets and kings who would have given their right arm to see what you are seeing but never got so much as a glimpse, to hear what you are hearing but never got so much as a whisper. One day he was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said, Master, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So he said, When you pray, say, Father, Reveal who you are. Set the world right. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. Then he said, Imagine what would happen if you went to a friend in the middle of the night and said, Friend, 
lend me three loaves of bread. An old friend traveling through just showed up, and I don't have a thing on hand. The friend answers from his bed, don't bother me. The door's locked, my children are all down for the night, I can't get up to give you anything. But let me tell you, even if you won't get up because he's a friend, if you stand your ground, knocking and waking all the neighbors, he'll finally get up and get you whatever you need. Here's what I'm saying. Ask and you'll get. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will open. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This is not a cat and mouse, hide and seek game we're in. If your little boy asks for a serving of fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? If your little girl asks for an egg, do you trick her with a spider? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing, you're at least decent to your own children. And don't you think the Father who conceived you in love will give the Holy Spirit when you ask Him? Jesus delivered a man from a demon that had kept him speechless. The demon gone, the man started talking a blue streak, taking the crowd by complete surprise. But some from the crowd were cynical. Black magic, they said. Some devil trick he's pulled from his sleeve. Others were skeptical, waiting around for him to prove himself with a spectacular miracle. Jesus knew what they were thinking and said, any country in civil war for very long is wasted. A constantly squabbling family falls to pieces. If Satan cancels Satan, is there any Satan left? You accuse me of ganging up with the devil, the prince of demons, to cast out demons, but if you're slinging devil mud at me, calling me a devil who kicks out devils, doesn't the same mud stick to your own exorcists? But if it's God's finger I'm pointing that sends the demons on their way, then God's kingdom is here for sure. When a strong man, armed to the teeth, stands guard in his front yard, his property is safe and sound. But what if a stronger man comes along with superior weapons? Then he's beaten at his own game, the arsenal that gave him such confidence hauled off, and his precious possessions plundered. This is war, and there is no neutral ground. If you're not on my side, you're the enemy, if you're not helping, you're making things worse. When a corrupting spirit is expelled from someone, it drifts along through the desert looking for an oasis, some unsuspecting soul it can bedevil. When it doesn't find anyone, it says, I'll go back to my old haunt. On return, it finds the person swept and dusted, but vacant. It then runs out and rounds up seven other spirits dirtier than itself and they all move in, whooping it up. That person ends up far worse than if he'd never gotten cleaned up in the first place. While he was saying these things, some woman lifted her voice above the murmur of the crowd, blessed the womb that carried you, and the breasts at which you nursed. Jesus commented, even more blessed are those who hear God's word and guard it with their lives. As the crowd swelled, he took a fresh tack, the mood of this age is all wrong. Everybody's looking for proof, but you're looking for the wrong kind. All you're looking for is something to titillate your curiosity, satisfy your lust for miracles. But the only proof you're going to get is the Jonah proof given to the Ninevites, which looks like no proof at all. What Jonah was to Nineveh, the Son of Man is to this age. On Judgment Day the Ninevites will stand up and give evidence that will condemn this generation, because when Jonah preached to them they changed their lives. A far greater preacher than Jonah is here, and you squabble about proofs. On Judgment Day the Queen of Sheba will come forward and bring evidence that condemns this generation, because she traveled from a far corner of the earth to listen to wise Solomon. 
Wisdom far greater than Solomon's is right in front of you, and you quibble over evidence. No one lights a lamp, then hides it in a drawer. It's put on a lamp stand so those entering the room have light to see where they're going. Your eye is a lamp, lighting up your whole body. If you live wide-eyed in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a musty cellar. Keep your eyes open, your lamp burning, so you don't get musty and murky. Keep your life as well lighted as your best lighted room. When he finished that talk, a Pharisee asked him to dinner. He entered his house and sat right down at the table. The Pharisee was shocked and somewhat offended when he saw that Jesus didn't wash up before the meal. But the master said to him, I know you Pharisees buff the surface of your cups and plates so they sparkle in the sun, but I also know your insides are maggoty with greed and secret evil. Stupid Pharisees! Didn't the one who made the outside also make the inside? Turn both your pockets and your hearts inside out and give generously to the poor, then your lives will be clean, not just your dishes and your hands. I've had it with you. You're hopeless, you Pharisees. Frauds. You keep meticulous account books, tithing on every nickel and dime you get, but manage to find loopholes for getting around basic matters of justice and God's love. Careful bookkeeping is commendable, but the basics are required. You're hopeless, you Pharisees. Frauds. You love sitting at the head table at church dinners, love preening yourselves in the radiance of public flattery. Frauds. You're just like unmarked graves, people walk over that nice, grassy surface, never suspecting the rot and corruption that is six feet under. One of the religion scholars spoke up, Teacher, do you realize that in saying these things you're insulting us? He said, Yes, and I can be even more explicit. You're hopeless, you religion scholars. You load people down with rules and regulations, nearly breaking their backs, but never lift even a finger to help. You're hopeless. You build tombs for the prophets your ancestors killed. The tombs you build are monuments to your murdering ancestors more than to the murdered prophets. That accounts for God's wisdom saying, I will send them prophets and apostles, but they'll kill them and run them off. What it means is that every drop of righteous blood ever spilled from the time earth began until now, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was struck down between altar and sanctuary, is on your heads. Yes, it's on the bill of this generation and this generation will pay. You're hopeless, you religion scholars. You took the key of knowledge, but instead of unlocking doors, you locked them. You won't go in yourself, and won't let anyone else in either. As soon as Jesus left the table, the religion scholars and Pharisees went into a rage. They went over and over everything he said, plotting how they could trap him in something from his own mouth. By this time the crowd, unwieldy and stepping on each other's toes, numbered into the thousands. But Jesus' primary concern was his disciples. He said to them, Watch yourselves carefully so you don't get contaminated with Pharisee yeast, Pharisee phoniness. You can't keep your true self hidden forever, before long you'll be exposed. You can't hide behind a religious mask forever, sooner or later the mask will slip and your true face will be known. You can't whisper one thing in private and preach the opposite in public, the day's coming when those whispers will be repeated all over town. I'm speaking to you as dear friends. Don't be bluffed into silence or insincerity by the threats of religious bullies. True, they can kill you, but then what can they do? 
There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God, who holds your entire life, body and soul, in His hands. What's the price of two or three pet canaries? Some loose change, right? But God never overlooks a single one. And He pays even greater attention to you, down to the last detail, even numbering the hairs on your head. So don't be intimidated by all this bully talk. You're worth more than a million canaries. Stand up for me among the people you meet and the Son of Man will stand up for you before all God's angels. But if you pretend you don't know me, do you think I'll defend you before God's angels? If you badmouth the Son of Man out of misunderstanding or ignorance, that can be overlooked. But if you're knowingly attacking God himself, taking aim at the Holy Spirit, that won't be overlooked. When they drag you into their meeting places, or into police courts and before judges, don't worry about defending yourselves, what you'll say or how you'll say it. The right words will be there. The Holy Spirit will give you the right words when the time comes. Someone out of the crowd said, Teacher, order my brother to give me a fair share of the family inheritance. He replied, Mister, what makes you think it's any of my business to be a judge or mediator for you? Speaking to the people, he went on, Take care. Protect yourself against the least bit of greed. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. Then he told them this story, the farm of a certain rich man produced a terrific crop. He talked to himself, what can I do? My barn isn't big enough for this harvest. Then he said, here's what I'll do, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll gather in all my grain and goods, and I'll say to myself, Self, you've done well. You've got it made and can now retire. Take it easy and have the time of your life. Just then God showed up and said, Fool! Tonight you die. And your barn full of goods, who gets it? That's what happens when you fill your barn with self and not with God. He continued this subject with his disciples. Don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or if the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There is far more to your inner life than the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the ravens, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, carefree in the care of God. And you count far more. Has anyone by fussing before the mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? If fussing can't even do that, why fuss at all? Walk into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They don't fuss with their appearance, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The ten best-dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the wildflowers, most of them never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is get you to relax, not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep yourself in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Don't be afraid of missing out. You're my dearest friends. The Father wants to give you the very kingdom itself. Be generous. Give to the poor. Get yourselves a bank that can't go bankrupt, a bank in heaven far from bank robbers, safe from embezzlers, a bank you can bank on. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be, and end up being. Keep your shirts on, 
keep the lights on. Be like house servants waiting for their master to come back from his honeymoon, awake and ready to open the door when he arrives and knocks. Lucky the servants whom the master finds on watch. He'll put on an apron, sit them at the table, and serve them a meal, sharing his wedding feast with them. It doesn't matter what time of the night he arrives, they're awake, and so blessed. You know that if the house owner had known what night the burglar was coming, he wouldn't have stayed out late and left the place unlocked. So don't you be lazy and careless. Just when you don't expect him, the Son of Man will show up. Peter said, Master, are you telling this story just for us? Or is it for everybody? The Master said, Let me ask you, who is the dependable manager, full of common sense, that the Master puts in charge of his staff to feed them well and on time? He is a blessed man if when the Master shows up he's doing his job. But if he says to himself, the master is certainly taking his time, begins beating up on the servants and maids, throws parties for his friends, and gets drunk, the master will walk in when he least expects it, give him the thrashing of his life, and put him back in the kitchen peeling potatoes. The servant who knows what his master wants and ignores it, or insolently does whatever he pleases, will be thoroughly thrashed. But if he does a poor job through ignorance, he'll get off with a slap on the hand. Great gifts mean great responsibilities, greater gifts, greater responsibilities. I've come to start a fire on this earth, how I wish it were blazing right now. I've come to change everything, turn everything right side up, how I long for it to be finished. Do you think I came to smooth things over and make everything nice? Not so. I've come to disrupt and confront. From now on, when you find five in a house, it will be three against two, and two against three, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother mother-in-law against bride, and bride against mother-in-law. Then he turned to the crowd, when you see clouds coming in from the west, you say, storms coming, and you're right. And when the wind comes out of the south, you say, this'll be a hot one, and you're right. Frauds. You know how to tell a change in the weather, so don't tell me you can't tell a change in the season the God season we're in right now. You don't have to be a genius to understand these things. Just use your common sense, the kind you'd use if, while being taken to court, you decided to settle up with your accuser on the way, knowing that if the case went to the judge you'd probably go to jail and pay every last penny of the fine. That's the kind of decision I'm asking you to make. About that time some people came up and told him about the Galileans Pilate had killed while they were at worship, mixing their blood with the blood of the sacrifices on the altar. Jesus responded, Do you think those murdered Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans? Not at all. Unless you turn to God, you, too, will die. And those eighteen in Jerusalem the other day, the ones crushed and killed and the Tower of Siloam collapsed and fell on them, do you think they were worse citizens than all other Jerusalemites? Not at all. Unless you turn to God, you, too, will die. Then he told them a story, a man had an apple tree planted in his front yard. He came to it expecting to find apples, but there weren't any. He said to his gardener, what's going on here? For three years now I've come to this tree expecting apples and not one apple have I found. Chop it down. Why waste good ground with it any longer? The gardener said, let's give it another year. I'll dig around it and fertilize, and maybe it will produce next year, if it doesn't, 
then chop it down. He was teaching in one of the meeting places on the Sabbath. There was a woman present, so twisted and bent over with arthritis that she couldn't even look up. She had been afflicted with this for eighteen years. When Jesus saw her, he called her over. Woman, you're free. He laid hands on her and suddenly she was standing straight and tall, giving glory to God. The meeting place president, furious because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the congregation, Six days have been defined as work days. Come on one of the six if you want to be healed, but not on the seventh, the Sabbath. But Jesus shot back, you frauds. Each Sabbath every one of you regularly unties your cow or donkey from its stall, leads it out for water, and thinks nothing of it. So why isn't it all right for me to untie this daughter of Abraham and lead her from the stall where Satan has had her tied these eighteen years? When he put it that way, his critics were left looking quite silly and red-faced. The congregation was delighted and cheered him on. Then he said, How can I picture God's kingdom for you? What kind of story can I use? It's like an acorn that a man plants in his front yard. It grows into a huge oak tree with thick branches, and eagles build nests in it. He tried again. How can I picture God's kingdom? It's like yeast that a woman works into enough dough for three loaves of bread, and waits while the dough rises. He went on teaching from town to village, village to town, but keeping on a steady course toward Jerusalem. A bystander said, Master, will only a few be saved? He said, Whether few or many is none of your business. Put your mind on your life with God. The way to life, to God, is vigorous and requires your total attention. A lot of you are going to assume that you'll sit down to God's salvation banquet just because you've been hanging around the neighborhood all your lives. Well, one day you're going to be banging on the door, wanting to get in, but you'll find the door locked and the master saying, sorry, you're not on my guest list. You'll protest, but we've known you all our lives, only to be interrupted with his abrupt, your kind of knowing can hardly be called knowing. You don't know the first thing about me. That's when you'll find yourselves out in the cold, strangers to grace. You'll watch Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets march into God's kingdom. You'll watch outsiders stream in from east, west, north, and south and sit down at the table of God's kingdom. And all the time you'll be outside looking in, and wondering what happened. This is the great reversal, the last in line put at the head of the line, and the so-called first ending up last. Just then some Pharisees came up and said, Run for your life. Herod's got your number. He's out to kill you. Jesus said, Tell that fox that I've no time for him right now. Today and tomorrow I'm busy clearing out the demons and healing the sick, the third day I'm wrapping things up. Besides, it's not proper for a prophet to come to a bad end outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killer of prophets. Abuser of the messengers of God. How often I've longed to gather your children. Gather your children like a hen, her brood safe under her wings. But you refused and turned away. And now it's too late, you won't see me again. Until the day you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of God. One time when Jesus went for a Sabbath meal with one of the top leaders of the Pharisees, all the guests had their eyes on him, watching his every move. Right before him there was a man hugely swollen in his joints. So Jesus asked the religion scholars and Pharisees present, Is it permitted to heal on the Sabbath? 
Yes or no? They were silent. So he took the man, healed him, and sent him on his way. Then he said, Is there anyone here who, if a child or animal fell down a well, wouldn't rush to pull him out immediately, not asking whether or not it was the Sabbath? They were stumped. There was nothing they could say to that. He went on to tell a story to the guests around the table. Noticing how each had tried to elbow into the place of honor, he said, when someone invites you to dinner, don't take the place of honor. Somebody more important than you might have been invited by the host. Then he'll come and call out in front of everybody, you're in the wrong place. The place of honor belongs to this man. Embarrassed, you'll have to make your way to the very last table, the only place left. When you're invited to dinner, go and sit at the last place. Then when the host comes he may very well say, friend, come up to the front. That will give the dinner guests something to talk about. What I'm saying is, if you walk around all high and mighty, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you will become more than yourself. Then he turned to the host. The next time you put on a dinner, don't just invite your friends and family and rich neighbors, the kind of people who will return the favor. Invite some people who never get invited out, the misfits from the wrong side of the tracks. You'll be, an experience, a blessing. They won't be able to return the favor, but the favor will be returned, oh, how it will be returned, at the resurrection of God's people. That triggered a response from one of the guests, how fortunate the one who gets to eat dinner in God's kingdom. Jesus followed up. Yes. For there was once a man who threw a great dinner party and invited many. When it was time for dinner, he sent out his servant to the invited guests, saying, Come on in, the food's on the table. Then they all began to beg off, one after another making excuses. The first said, I bought a piece of property and need to look it over. Send my regrets. Another said, I just bought five teams of oxen, and I really need to check them out. Send my regrets. And yet another said, I just got married and need to get home to my wife. The servant went back and told the master what had happened. He was outraged and told the servant, quickly, get out into the city streets and alleys. Collect all who look like they need a square meal, all the misfits and homeless and down and out you can lay your hands on, and bring them here. The servant reported back, Master, I did what you commanded, and there's still room. The master said, then go to the country roads. Whoever you find, drag them in. I want my house full. Let me tell you, not one of those originally invited is going to get so much as a bite at my dinner party. One day when large groups of people were walking along with him, Jesus turned and told them, Anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even one's own self, can't be my disciple. Anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow behind me can't be my disciple. Is there anyone here who, planning to build a new house, doesn't first sit down and figure the cost so you'll know if you can complete it? If you only get the foundation laid and then run out of money, you're going to look pretty foolish. Everyone passing by will poke fun at you, he started something he couldn't finish. Or can you imagine a king going into battle against another king without first deciding whether it is possible with his 10,000 troops to face the 20,000 troops of the other? And if he decides he can't, won't he send an emissary and work out a truce? Simply put, if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, you can't be my disciple. Salt is excellent. 
But if the salt goes flat, it's useless, good for nothing. Are you listening to this? Really listening? By this time a lot of men and women of questionable reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and religion scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled, he takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. Their grumbling triggered this story. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one. Wouldn't you leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the lost one until you found it? When found, you can be sure you would put it across your shoulders, rejoicing, and when you got home call in your friends and neighbors, saying, celebrate with me. I found my lost sheep. Count on it, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life than over ninety-nine good people in no need of rescue. Or imagine a woman who has ten coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and scour the house, looking in every nook and cranny until she finds it? And when she finds it you can be sure she'll call her friends and neighbors, celebrate with me. I found my lost coin. Count on it, that's the kind of party God's angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. Then he said, there was once a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, Father, I want right now what's coming to me. So the father divided the property between them. It wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a distant country. There, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. After he had gone through all his money, there was a bad famine all through that country and he began to feel it. He signed on with a citizen there who assigned him to his fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry he would have eaten the corn cobs and the pig slop, but no one would give him any. That brought him to his senses. He said, all those farmhands working for my father sit down to three meals a day, and here I am starving to death. I'm going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God, I've sinned before you, I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. He got right up and went home to his father. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His heart pounding, he ran out, embraced him, and kissed him. The son started his speech, Father, I've sinned against God, I've sinned before you, I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to the servants, Quick! Bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a prize-winning heifer and roast it. We're going to feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now alive. Given up for lost and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. All this time his older son was out in the field. When the day's work was done he came in. As he approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. Calling over one of the houseboys, he asked what was going on. He told him, your brother came home. Your father has ordered a feast, barbecued beef, because he has him home safe and sound. The older brother stomped off in an angry sulk and refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. The son said, Look how many years I've stayed here serving you, never giving you one moment of grief, but have you ever thrown a party for me and my friends? Then this son of yours who has thrown away your money on whores shows up and you go all out with a feast. His father said, Son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time, and everything that is mine is yours, but this is a wonderful time 
and we had to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead, and he's alive. He was lost, and he's found. Jesus said to his disciples, There was once a rich man who had a manager. He got reports that the manager had been taking advantage of his position by running up huge personal expenses. So he called him in and said, What's this I hear about you? You're fired. And I want a complete audit of your books. The manager said to himself, What am I going to do? I've lost my job as manager. I'm not strong enough for a laboring job, and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I've got a plan. Here's what I'll do, then when I'm turned out into the street, people will take me into their houses. Then he went at it. One after another, he called in the people who were in debt to his master. He said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He replied, A hundred jugs of olive oil. The manager said, Here, take your bill, sit down here, quick now, write fifty. To the next he said, And you, what do you owe? He answered, a hundred sacks of wheat. He said, Take your bill, write in eighty. Now here's a surprise, the master praised the crooked manager. And why? Because he knew how to look after himself. Streetwise people are smarter in this regard than law-abiding citizens. They are on constant alert, looking for angles, surviving by their wits. I want you to be smart in the same way, but for what is right, using every adversity to stimulate you to creative survival, to concentrate your attention on the bare essentials, so you'll live, really live, and not complacently just get by on good behavior. Jesus went on to make these comments. If you're honest in small things, you'll be honest in big things. If you're a crook in small things, you'll be a crook in big things. If you're not honest in small jobs, who will put you in charge of the store? No worker can serve two bosses. He'll either hate the first and love the second, or adore the first and despise the second. You can't serve both God and the bank. When the Pharisees, a money-obsessed bunch, heard him say these things, they rolled their eyes, dismissing him as hopelessly out of touch. So Jesus spoke to them, You are masters at making yourselves look good in front of others, but God knows what's behind the appearance. What society sees and calls monumental, God sees through and calls monstrous. God's law and the prophets climaxed in John. Now it's all kingdom of God, the glad news. And compelling invitation to every man and woman. The sky will disintegrate and the earth dissolve. Before a single letter of God's law wears out. Using the legalities of divorce. As a cover for lust is adultery using the legalities of marriage. As a cover for lust is adultery. There once was a rich man, expensively dressed in the latest fashions, wasting his days in conspicuous consumption. A poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, had been dumped on his doorstep. All he lived for was to get a meal from scraps off the rich man's table. His best friends were the dogs who came and licked his sores. Then he died, this poor man, and was taken up by the angels to the lap of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell and in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham in the distance and Lazarus in his lap. He called out, Father Abraham, mercy. Have mercy. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in water to cool my tongue. I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham said, Child, 
remember that in your lifetime you got the good things and Lazarus the bad things. It's not like that here. Here he's consoled and you're tormented. Besides, in all these matters there is a huge chasm set between us so that no one can go from us to you even if he wanted to, nor can anyone cross over from you to us. The rich man said, Then let me ask you, Father, send him to the house of my father where I have five brothers, so he can tell them the score and warn them so they won't end up here in this place of torment. Abraham answered, They have Moses and the prophets to tell them the score. Let them listen to them. I know, Father Abraham, he said, but they're not listening. If someone came back to them from the dead, they would change their ways. Abraham replied, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to be convinced by someone who rises from the dead. He said to his disciples, Hard trials and temptations are bound to come, but too bad for whoever brings them on. Better to wear a concrete vest and take a swim with the fishes than give even one of these dear little ones a hard time. Be alert. If you see your friend going wrong, correct him. If he responds, forgive him. Even if it's personal against you and repeated seven times through the day, and seven times he says, I'm sorry, I won't do it again, forgive him. The apostles came up and said to the Master, Give us more faith. But the Master said, You don't need more faith. There is no more or less in faith. If you have a bare kernel of faith, say the size of a poppy seed, you could say to this sycamore tree, Go jump in the lake, and it would do it. Suppose one of you has a servant who comes in from plowing the field or tending the sheep. Would you take his coat, set the table, and say, sit down and eat? Wouldn't you be more likely to say, prepare dinner, change your clothes and wait table for me until I've finished my coffee, then go to the kitchen and have your supper? Does the servant get special thanks for doing what's expected of him? It's the same with you. When you've done everything expected of you, be matter-of-fact and say, the work is done. What we were told to do, we did. It happened that as he made his way toward Jerusalem, he crossed over the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men, all lepers, met him. They kept their distance but raised their voices, calling out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Taking a good look at them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. They went, and while still on their way, became clean. One of them, when he realized that he was healed, turned around and came back, shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet, so grateful. He couldn't thank him enough and he was a Samaritan. Jesus said, We're not ten healed. Where are the nine? Can none be found to come back and give glory to God except this outsider? Then he said to him, Get up. On your way. Your faith has healed and saved you. Jesus, grilled by the Pharisees on when the kingdom of God would come, answered, the kingdom of God doesn't come by counting the days on the calendar. Nor when someone says, look here, or, there it is. And why? Because God's kingdom is already among you. He went on to say to his disciples, the days are coming when you are going to be desperately homesick for just a glimpse of one of the days of the Son of Man, and you won't see a thing. And they'll say to you, look over there, or, look here. Don't fall for any of that nonsense. The arrival of the Son of Man is not something you go out to see. He simply comes. You know how the whole sky lights up from a single flash of lightning. That's how it will be on the day of the Son of Man. 
But first it's necessary that he suffer many things and be turned down by the people of today. The time of the Son of Man will be just like the time of Noah, everyone carrying on as usual, having a good time right up to the day Noah boarded the ship. They suspected nothing until the flood hit and swept everything away. It was the same in the time of Lot, the people carrying on, having a good time, business as usual right up to the day Lot walked out of Sodom and a firestorm swept down and burned everything to a crisp. That's how it will be, sudden, total, when the Son of Man is revealed. When the day arrives and you're out working in the yard, don't run into the house to get anything. And if you're out in the field, don't go back and get your coat. Remember what happened to Lot's wife. If you grasp and cling to life on your terms, you'll lose it, but if you let that life go, you'll get life on God's terms. On that day, two men will be in the same boat fishing, one taken, the other left. Two women will be working in the same kitchen, one taken, the other left. Trying to take all this in, the disciples said, Master, where? He told them, Watch for the circling of the vultures. They'll spot the corpse first. The action will begin around my dead body. Jesus told them a story showing that it was necessary for them to pray consistently and never quit. He said, there was once a judge in some city who never gave God a thought and cared nothing for people. A widow in that city kept after him, my rights are being violated. Protect me. He never gave her the time of day. But after this went on and on he said to himself, I care nothing what God thinks, even less what people think. But because this widow won't quit badgering me, I'd better do something and see that she gets justice, otherwise I'm going to end up beaten black and blue by her pounding. Then the master said, Do you hear what that judge, corrupt as he is, is saying? So what makes you think God won't step in and work justice for his chosen people? who continue to cry out for help. Won't he stick up for them? I assure you, he will. He will not drag his feet. But how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on the earth when he returns? He told his next story to some who were complacently pleased with themselves over their moral performance and looked down their noses at the common people, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax man. The Pharisee posed and prayed like this, Oh, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, crooks, adulterers, or, heaven forbid, like this tax man. I fast twice a week and tithe on all my income. Meanwhile the tax man, slumped in the shadows, his face in his hands, not daring to look up, said, God, give mercy. Forgive me, a sinner. Jesus commented, this tax man, not the other, went home made right with God. If you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face, but if you're content to be simply yourself, you will become more than yourself. People brought babies to Jesus, hoping he might touch them. When the disciples saw it, they shooed them off. Jesus called them back. Let these children alone. Don't get between them and me. These children are the kingdom's pride and joy. Mark this, unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you'll never get in. One day one of the local officials asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to deserve eternal life? Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandments, don't you? No illicit sex, no killing, no stealing, no lying, honor your father and mother. He said, I've kept them all for as long as I can remember. When Jesus heard that, he said, 
then there's only one thing left to do, sell everything you own and give it away to the poor. You will have riches in heaven. Then come, follow me. This was the last thing the official expected to hear. He was very rich and became terribly sad. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let them go. Seeing his reaction, Jesus said, Do you have any idea how difficult it is for people who have it all to enter God's kingdom? I'd say it's easier to thread a camel through a needle's eye than get a rich person into God's kingdom. Then who has any chance at all, the others asked. No chance at all, Jesus said, if you think you can pull it off by yourself. Every chance in the world if you trust God to do it. Peter tried to regain some initiative, we left everything we owned and followed you, didn't we? Yes, said Jesus, and you won't regret it. No one who has sacrificed home, spouse, brothers and sisters, parents, children, whatever, will lose out. It will all come back multiplied many times over in your lifetime. And then the bonus of eternal life. Then Jesus took the twelve off to the side and said, Listen carefully. We're on our way up to Jerusalem. Everything written in the prophets about the Son of Man will take place. He will be handed over to the Romans, jeered at, ridiculed, and spit on. Then, after giving him the third degree, they will kill him. In three days he will rise, alive. But they didn't get it, could make neither heads nor tails of what he was talking about. He came to the outskirts of Jericho. A blind man was sitting beside the road asking for handouts. When he heard the rustle of the crowd, he asked what was going on. They told him, Jesus the Nazarene is going by. He yelled, Jesus! Son of David! Mercy, have mercy on me! Those ahead of Jesus told the man to shut up, but he only yelled all the louder, Son of David! Mercy, have mercy on me! Jesus stopped and ordered him to be brought over. When he had come near, Jesus asked, What do you want from me? He said, Master, I want to see again. Jesus said, Go ahead, see again. Your faith has saved and healed you. The healing was instant, he looked up, seeing, and then followed Jesus, glorifying God. Everyone in the street joined in, shouting praise to God. Then Jesus entered and walked through Jericho. There was a man there, his name Zacchaeus, the head tax man and quite rich. He wanted desperately to see Jesus, but the crowd was in his way, he was a short man and couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran on ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus when he came by. When Jesus got to the tree, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry down. Today is my day to be a guest in your home. Zacchaeus scrambled out of the tree, hardly believing his good luck, delighted to take Jesus home with him. Everyone who saw the incident was indignant and grumped, what business does he have getting cozy with this crook? Zacchaeus just stood there, a little stunned. He stammered apologetically, Master, I give away half my income to the poor, and if I'm caught cheating, I pay four times the damages. Jesus said, Today is salvation day in this home. Here he is, Zacchaeus, son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to find and restore the lost. While he had their attention, and because they were getting close to Jerusalem by this time an expectation was building that God's kingdom would appear any minute, he told this story. There was once a man descended from a royal house who needed to make a long trip back to headquarters to get authorization for his rule and then return. 
But first he called ten servants together, gave them each a sum of money, and instructed them, Operate with this until I return. But the citizens there hated him. So they sent a commission with a signed petition to oppose his rule, We don't want this man to rule us. When he came back bringing the authorization of his rule, he called those ten servants to whom he had given the money to find out how they had done. The first said, Master, I doubled your money. He said, Good servant. Great work. Because you've been trustworthy in this small job, I'm making you governor of ten towns. The second said, Master, I made a 50% profit on your money. He said, I'm putting you in charge of five towns. The next servant said, Master, here's your money safe and sound. I kept it hidden in the cellar. To tell you the truth, I was a little afraid. I know you have high standards and hate sloppiness, and don't suffer fools gladly. He said, you're right that I don't suffer fools gladly, and you've acted the fool. Why didn't you at least invest the money in securities so I would have gotten a little interest on it? Then he said to those standing there, take the money from him and give it to the servant who doubled my stake. They said, but master, he already has double. He said, that's what I mean, risk your life and get more than you ever dreamed of. Play it safe and end up holding the bag. As for these enemies of mine who petitioned against my rule, clear them out of here. I don't want to see their faces around here again. After saying these things, Jesus headed straight up to Jerusalem. When he got near Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olives, he sent off two of the disciples with instructions, Go to the village across from you. As soon as you enter, you'll find a colt tethered, one that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says anything, asks, What are you doing? Say, His master needs him. The two left and found it just as he said. As they were untying the colt, its owner said, What are you doing untying the colt? They said, His master needs him. They brought the colt to Jesus. Then, throwing their coats on its back, they helped Jesus get on. As he rode, the people gave him a grand welcome, throwing their coats on the street. Right at the crest, where Mount Olives begins its descent, the whole crowd of disciples burst into enthusiastic praise over all the mighty works they had witnessed. Blessed is he who comes. The King in God's name. All's well in heaven. Glory in the high places. Some Pharisees from the crowd told him, Teacher, get your disciples under control. But he said, if they kept quiet, the stones would do it for them, shouting praise. When the city came into view, he wept over it. If you had only recognized this day, and everything that was good for you. But now it's too late. In the days ahead your enemies are going to bring up their heavy artillery and surround you, pressing in from every side. They'll smash you and your babies on the pavement. Not one stone will be left intact. All this because you didn't recognize and welcome God's personal visit. Going into the temple he began to throw out everyone who had set up shop, selling everything and anything. He said, It's written in scripture. My house is a house of prayer. You have turned it into a religious bazaar. From then on he taught each day in the temple. The high priests, religion scholars, and the leaders of the people were trying their best to find a way to get rid of him. But with the people hanging on every word he spoke, they couldn't come up with anything. One day he was teaching the people in the temple, proclaiming the message. The high priests, religion scholars, and leaders confronted him and demanded, Show us your credentials. 
Who authorized you to speak and act like this? Jesus answered, First, let me ask you a question, about the baptism of John, who authorized it, heaven or humans? They were on the spot, and knew it. They pulled back into a huddle and whispered, If we say, heaven, he'll ask us why we didn't believe him, if we say, humans, the people will tear us limb from limb, convinced as they are that John was God's prophet. They agreed to concede that round to Jesus and said they didn't know. Jesus said, Then neither will I answer your question. Jesus told another story to the people, a man planted a vineyard. He handed it over to farmhands and went off on a trip. He was gone a long time. In time he sent a servant back to the farmhands to collect the prophets, but they beat him up and sent him off empty-handed. He decided to try again and sent another servant. That one they beat black and blue, and sent him off empty-handed. He tried a third time. They worked that servant over from head to foot and dumped him in the street. Then the owner of the vineyard said, I know what I'll do, I'll send my beloved son. They're bound to respect my son. But when the farmhand saw him coming, they quickly put their heads together. This is our chance, this is the heir. Let's kill him and have it all to ourselves. They killed him and threw him over the fence. What do you think the owner of the vineyard will do? Right. He'll come and get rid of everyone. Then he'll assign the care of the vineyard to others. Those who were listening said, Oh, no. He'd never do that. But Jesus didn't back down. Why, then, do you think this was written? That stone the masons threw out. It's now the cornerstone. Anyone falling over that stone will break every bone in his body, if the stone falls on anyone, he'll be smashed to smithereens. The religion scholars and high priests wanted to lynch him on the spot, but they were intimidated by public opinion. They knew the story was about them. Watching for a chance to get him, they sent spies who posed as honest inquirers, hoping to trick him into saying something that would get him in trouble with the law. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you're honest and straightforward when you teach, that you don't pander to anyone but teach the way of God accurately. Tell us, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He knew they were laying for him and said, Show me a coin. Now, this engraving, who does it look like and what does it say? Caesar, they said. Jesus said, then give Caesar what is his and give God what is his. Try as they might, they couldn't trap him into saying anything incriminating. His answer caught them off guard and left them speechless. Some Sadducees came up. This is the Jewish party that denies any possibility of resurrection. They asked, Teacher, Moses wrote us that if a man dies and leaves a wife but no child, his brother is obligated to marry her and give her children. Well, there once were seven brothers. The first took a wife. He died childless. The second married her and died, then the third, and eventually all seven had their turn, but no child. After all that, the wife died. That wife, now, in the resurrection whose wife is she? All seven married her. Jesus said, marriage is a major preoccupation here, but not there. Those who are included in the resurrection of the dead will no longer be concerned with marriage nor, of course, with death. They will have better things to think about, if you can believe it. All ecstasies and intimacies then will be with God. Even Moses exclaimed about resurrection at the burning bush, saying, God, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. 
God isn't the God of dead men, but of the living. To him all are alive. Some of the religion scholars said, Teacher, that's a great answer. For a while, anyway, no one dared put questions to him. Then he put a question to them, How is it that they say that the Messiah is David's son? In the book of Psalms, David clearly says, God said to my master, Sit here at my right hand, until I put your enemies under your feet. David here designates the Messiah as my master, so how can the Messiah also be his son? With everybody listening, Jesus spoke to his disciples. Watch out for the religion scholars. They love to walk around in academic gowns, preen in the radiance of public flattery, bask in prominent positions, sit at the head table at every church function. And all the time they are exploiting the weak and helpless. The longer their prayers, the worse they get. But they'll pay for it in the end. Just then he looked up and saw the rich people dropping offerings in the collection plate. Then he saw a poor widow put in two pennies. He said, The plain truth is that this widow has given by far the largest offering today. All these others made offerings that they'll never miss, she gave extravagantly what she couldn't afford, she gave her all. One day people were standing around talking about the temple, remarking how beautiful it was, the splendor of its stonework and memorial gifts. Jesus said, All this you're admiring so much, the time is coming when every stone in that building will end up in a heap of rubble. They asked him, Teacher, when is this going to happen? What clue will we get that it's about to take place? He said, Watch out for the doomsday deceivers. Many leaders are going to show up with forged identities claiming, I'm the one, or, the end is near. Don't fall for any of that. When you hear of wars and uprisings, keep your head and don't panic. This is routine history and no sign of the end. He went on, nation will fight nation and ruler fight ruler, over and over. Huge earthquakes will occur in various places. There will be famines. You'll think at times that the very sky is falling. But before any of this happens, they'll arrest you, hunt you down, and drag you to court and jail. It will go from bad to worse, dog eat dog, everyone at your throat because you carry my name. You'll end up on the witness stand, called to testify. Make up your mind right now not to worry about it. I'll give you the words and wisdom that will reduce all your accusers to stammers and stutters. You'll even be turned in by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends. Some of you will be killed. There's no telling who will hate you because of me. Even so, every detail of your body and soul, even the hairs of your head, is in my care, nothing of you will be lost. Staying with it, that's what is required. Stay with it to the end. You won't be sorry, you'll be saved. When you see soldiers camped all around Jerusalem, then you'll know that she is about to be devastated. If you're living in Judea at the time, run for the hills. If you're in the city, get out quickly. If you're out in the fields, don't go home to get your coat. This is the day of reckoning, everything written about it will come to a head. Pregnant and nursing mothers will have it especially hard. Incredible misery. Torrential rage. People dropping like flies, people dragged off to prisons, Jerusalem under the boot of barbarians until the nations finish what was given them to do. It will seem like all hell has broken loose, sun, moon, stars, earth, See, in an uproar and everyone all over the world in a panic, the wind knocked out of them by the threat of doom, the powers that be quaking. And then, 
Then, they'll see the Son of Man welcomed in grand style, a glorious welcome. When all this starts to happen, up on your feet. Stand tall with your heads high. Help is on the way. He told them a story. Look at a fig tree. Any tree for that matter. When the leaves begin to show, one look tells you that summer is right around the corner. The same here, when you see these things happen, you know God's kingdom is about here. Don't brush this off, I'm not just saying this for some future generation, but for this one, too, these things will happen. Sky and earth will wear out, my words won't wear out. But be on your guard. Don't let the sharp edge of your expectation get dulled by parties and drinking and shopping. Otherwise, that day is going to take you by complete surprise, spring on you suddenly like a trap, for it's going to come on everyone, everywhere, at once. So, whatever you do, don't fall asleep at the wheel. Pray constantly that you will have the strength and wits to make it through everything that's coming and end up on your feet before the Son of Man. He spent his days in the temple teaching, but his nights out on the mountain called Olives. All the people were up at the crack of dawn to come to the temple and listen to him. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, also called Passover, drew near. The high priests and religion scholars were looking for a way to do away with Jesus but, fearful of the people, they were also looking for a way to cover their tracks. That's when Satan entered Judas, the one called Iscariot. He was one of the twelve. Leaving the others, he conferred with the high priests and the temple guards about how he might betray Jesus to them. They couldn't believe their good luck and agreed to pay him well. He gave them his word and started looking for a way to betray Jesus, but out of sight of the crowd. The day of unleavened bread came, the day the Passover lamb was butchered. Jesus sent Peter and John off, saying, Go prepare the Passover for us so we can eat it together. They said, Where do you want us to do this? He said, Keep your eyes open as you enter the city. A man carrying a water jug will meet you. Follow him home. Then speak with the owner of the house. The teacher wants to know, Where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will show you a spacious second-story room, swept and ready. Prepare the meal there. They left, found everything just as he told them, and prepared the Passover meal. When it was time, he sat down, all the apostles with him, and said, You've no idea how much I have looked forward to eating this Passover meal with you before I enter my time of suffering. It's the last one I'll eat until we all eat it together in the kingdom of God. Taking the cup, he blessed it, then said, Take this and pass it among you. As for me, I'll not drink wine again until the kingdom of God arrives. Taking bread, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Eat it in my memory. He did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant written in my blood, blood poured out for you. Do you realize that the hand of the one who is betraying me is at this moment on this table? It's true that the Son of Man is going down a path already marked out, no surprises there. But for the one who turns him in, turns traitor to the Son of Man, this is doomsday. They immediately became suspicious of each other and began quizzing one another, wondering who might be about to do this. Within minutes they were bickering over who of them would end up the greatest. But Jesus intervened, kings like to throw their weight around and people in authority like to give themselves fancy titles. It's not going to be that way with you. Let the senior among you become like the junior, let the leader act the part of the servant. Who would you rather be, 
the one who eats the dinner or the one who serves the dinner. You'd rather eat and be served, right? But I've taken my place among you as the one who serves. And you've stuck with me through thick and thin. Now I confer on you the royal authority my father conferred on me so you can eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and be strengthened as you take up responsibilities among the congregations of God's people. Simon, stay on your toes. Satan has tried his best to separate all of you from me, like chaff from wheat. Simon, I've prayed for you in particular that you not give in or give out. When you have come through the time of testing, turn to your companions and give them a fresh start. Peter said, Master, I'm ready for anything with you. I'd go to jail for you. I'd die for you. Jesus said, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Peter, but before the rooster crows you will have three times denied that you know me. Then Jesus said, when I sent you out and told you to travel light, to take only the bare necessities, did you get along all right? Certainly, they said, we got along just fine. He said, this is different. Get ready for trouble. Look to what you'll need, there are difficult times ahead. Pawn your coat and get a sword. What was written in scripture, he was lumped in with the criminals, gets its final meaning in me. Everything written about me is now coming to a conclusion. They said, Look, Master, two swords. But he said, Enough of that, no more sword talk. Leaving there, he went, as he so often did, to Mount Olives. The disciples followed him. When they arrived at the place, he said, Pray that you don't give in to temptation. He pulled away from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed, Father, remove this cup from me. But please, not what I want. What do you want? At once an angel from heaven was at his side, strengthening him. He prayed on all the harder. Sweat, wrung from him like drops of blood, poured off his face. He got up from prayer, went back to the disciples and found them asleep, drugged by grief. He said, What business do you have sleeping? Get up. Pray so you won't give in to temptation. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than a crowd showed up, Judas, the one from the twelve, in the lead. He came right up to Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said, Judas, you would betray the Son of Man with a kiss. When those with him saw what was happening, they said, Master, shall we fight? One of them took a swing at the chief priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Jesus said, Let them be. Even in this. Then, touching the servant's ear, he healed him. Jesus spoke to those who had come, high priests, temple police, religion leaders, what is this, jumping me with swords and clubs as if I were a dangerous criminal? Day after day I've been with you in the temple and you've not so much as lifted a hand against me. But do it your way, it's a dark night, a dark hour. Arresting Jesus, they marched him off and took him into the house of the chief priest. Peter followed, but at a safe distance. In the middle of the courtyard some people had started a fire and were sitting around it, trying to keep warm. One of the serving maids sitting at the fire and noticed him, then took a second look and said, this man was with him. He denied it, woman, I don't even know him. A short time later, someone else noticed him and said, you're one of them. But Peter denied it, man, I am not. About an hour later, someone else spoke up, really adamant, he's got to have been with him. He's got Galilean written all over him. Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. At that very moment, 
the last word hardly off his lips, a rooster crowed. Just then, the master turned and looked at Peter. Peter remembered what the master had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. He went out and cried and cried and cried. The men in charge of Jesus began poking fun at him, slapping him around. They put a blindfold on him and taunted, who hit you that time? They were having a grand time with him. When it was morning, the religious leaders of the people and the high priests and scholars all got together and brought him before their high council. They said, Are you the Messiah? He answered, If I said yes, you wouldn't believe me. If I asked what you meant by your question, you wouldn't answer me. So here's what I have to say, from here on the Son of Man takes his place at God's right hand, the place of power. They all said, so you admit your claim to be the Son of God. You're the ones who keep saying it, he said. But they had made up their minds, why do we need any more evidence? We've all heard him as good as say it himself. Then they all took Jesus to Pilate and began to bring up charges against him. They said, We found this man undermining our law and order, forbidding taxes to be paid to Caesar, setting himself up as Messiah King. Pilate asked him, Is this true that you're King of the Jews? Those are your words, not mine, Jesus replied. Pilate told the high priests and the accompanying crowd, I find nothing wrong here. He seems harmless enough to me. But they were vehement. He's stirring up unrest among the people with his teaching, disturbing the peace everywhere, starting in Galilee and now all through Judea. He's a dangerous man, endangering the peace. When Pilate heard that, he asked, So, he's a Galilean? Realizing that he properly came under Herod's jurisdiction, he passed the buck to Herod, who just happened to be in Jerusalem for a few days. Herod was delighted when Jesus showed up. He had wanted for a long time to see him, he'd heard so much about him. He hoped to see him do something spectacular. He peppered him with questions. Jesus didn't answer, not one word. But the high priests and religion scholars were right there, saying their peace, strident and shrill in their accusations. Mightily offended, Herod turned on Jesus. His soldiers joined in, taunting and jeering. Then they dressed him up in an elaborate king costume and sent him back to Pilate. That day Herod and Pilate became thick as thieves. Always before they had kept their distance. Then Pilate called in the high priests, rulers, and the others and said, You brought this man to me as a disturber of the peace. I examined him in front of all of you and found there was nothing to your charge. And neither did Herod, for he has sent him back here with a clean bill of health. It's clear that he's done nothing wrong, let alone anything deserving death. I'm going to warn him to watch his step and let him go. At that, the crowd went wild, kill him. Give us Barabbas. Barabbas had been thrown in prison for starting a riot in the city and for murder. Pilate still wanted to let Jesus go, and so spoke out again. But they kept shouting back, Crucify! Crucify him! He tried a third time. But for what crime? I found nothing in him deserving death. I'm going to warn him to watch his step and let him go. But they kept at it, a shouting mob, demanding that he be crucified. And finally they shouted him down. Pilate caved in and gave them what they wanted. He released the man thrown in prison for rioting and murder and gave them Jesus to do whatever they wanted. As they led him off, they made Simon, 
a man from Cyrene who happened to be coming in from the countryside, carry the cross behind Jesus. A huge crowd of people followed, along with women weeping and carrying on. At one point Jesus turned to the women and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves and for your children. The time is coming when they'll say, Lucky the women who never conceived. Lucky the wombs that never gave birth. Lucky the breasts that never gave milk. Then they'll start calling to the mountains, fall down on us, calling to the hills, cover us up. If people do these things to a live, green tree, can you imagine what they'll do with Deadwood? Two others, both criminals, were taken along with him for execution. When they got to the place called Skull Hill, they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Dividing up his clothes, they threw dice for them. The people stood there staring at Jesus, and the ringleaders made faces, taunting, he saved others. Let's see him save himself. The Messiah of God, ha. The Chosen, ha. The soldiers also came up and poked fun at him, making a game of it. They toasted him with sour wine, so you're king of the Jews. Save yourself. Printed over him was a sign, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging alongside cursed him, some Messiah you are. Save yourself. Save us. But the other one made him shut up, have you no fear of God? You're getting the same as him. We deserve this, but not him, he did nothing to deserve this. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. He said, don't worry, I will. Today you will join me in paradise. By now it was noon. The whole earth became dark, the darkness lasting three hours, a total blackout. The temple curtain split right down the middle. Jesus called loudly, Father, I place my life in your hands. Then he breathed his last. When the captain there saw what happened, he honored God, this man was innocent. A good man, and innocent. All who had come around as spectators to watch the show, when they saw what actually happened, were overcome with grief and headed home. Those who knew Jesus well, along with the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a respectful distance and kept vigil. There was a man by the name of Joseph, a member of the Jewish High Council, a man of good heart and good character. He had not gone along with the plans and actions of the council. His hometown was the Jewish village of Arimathea. He lived in alert expectation of the kingdom of God. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Taking him down, he wrapped him in a linen shroud and placed him in a tomb chiseled into the rock, a tomb never yet used. It was the day before Sabbath, the Sabbath just about to begin. The women who had been companions of Jesus from Galilee followed along. They saw the tomb where Jesus' body was placed. Then they went back to prepare burial spices and perfumes. They rested quietly on the Sabbath, as commanded. At the crack of dawn on Sunday, the women came to the tomb carrying the burial spices they had prepared. They found the entrance stone rolled back from the tomb, so they walked in. But once inside, they couldn't find the body of the Master Jesus. They were puzzled, wondering what to make of this. Then, out of nowhere it seemed, two men, light cascading over them, stood there. The women were awestruck and bowed down in worship. The men said, Why are you looking for the living one in a cemetery? He is not here, but raised up. 
Remember how he told you when you were still back in Galilee that he had to be handed over to sinners, be killed on a cross, and in three days rise up. Then they remembered Jesus' words. They left the tomb and broke the news of all this to the eleven and the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them kept telling these things to the apostles, but the apostles didn't believe a word of it, thought they were making it all up. But Peter jumped to his feet and ran to the tomb. He stooped to look in and saw a few grave clothes, that's all. He walked away puzzled, shaking his head. That same day two of them were walking to the village Emmaus, about seven miles out of Jerusalem. They were deep in conversation, going over all these things that had happened. In the middle of their talk and questions, Jesus came up and walked along with them. But they were not able to recognize who he was. He asked, What's this you're discussing so intently as you walk along? They just stood there, long-faced, like they had lost their best friend. Then one of them, his name was Cleopat, said, Are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's happened during the last few days? He said, What has happened? They said, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene. He was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and all the people. Then our high priests and leaders betrayed him, got him sentenced to death, and crucified him. And we had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. And it is now the third day since it happened. But now some of our women have completely confused us. Early this morning they were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They came back with the story that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of our friends went off to the tomb to check and found it empty just as the women said, but they didn't see Jesus. Then he said to them, so thick-headed, so slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all that the prophets said? Don't you see that these things had to happen, that the Messiah had to suffer and only then enter into his glory? Then he started at the beginning, with the books of Moses, and went on through all the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. They came to the edge of the village where they were headed. He acted as if he were going on but they pressed him, stay and have supper with us. It's nearly evening the day is done. So he went in with them. And here is what happened, he sat down at the table with them. Taking the bread, he blessed and broke and gave it to them. At that moment, open-eyed, wide-eyed, they recognized him. And then he disappeared. Back and forth they talked. Didn't we feel on fire as he conversed with us on the road? as he opened up the scriptures for us. They didn't waste a minute. They were up and on their way back to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their friends gathered together, talking away, it's really happened. The master has been raised up, Simon saw him. Then the two went over everything that happened on the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. While they were saying all this, Jesus appeared to them and said, Peace be with you. They thought they were seeing a ghost and were scared half to death. He continued with them, Don't be upset, and don't let all these doubting questions take over. Look at my hands, look at my feet, it's really me. Touch me. Look me over from head to toe. A ghost doesn't have muscle and bone like this. As he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. They still couldn't believe what they were seeing. It was too much, it seemed too good to be true.